Well, thank you very much for having me uh, speak today. Um, I'm Gary Grady, as, as was introduced. Um, the, I work at Los Alamos um, and have for almost ever. Um, and my talk today will be about MarFS, um, which is a scalable near POSIX file system that uh, lives over cloud objects for cool storage and HPC that we have been writing for a while and is in production at Los Alamos now. Um, and I, um, but first, I'm going to take you through a whole bunch of, of background about HPC because I don't know how, you know, what how many people in the audience understand the the lunatic fringe of HPC. So um, I'm going to do that first. So Los Alamos, um, you know, when I went to school, uh, Los Alamos was part of the required reading in World War II. That, that's not necessarily true anymore. So I find that lots of people don't even know what Los Alamos is. It's actually where nuclear weapons were invented. Um, the first atomic bomb was invented at Los Alamos and. We've been in the nuclear weapons business for forever. We'll be the first and probably the longest, definitely the longest. Um, you can see some old pictures here of the Sudan crater, which is uh, out in Nevada. Um, i actually been there once. A friend of mine got married there. Um, <laughs> two, two physicists and a physicist that happened to be an ordained minister that were visiting the site, and it's very odd. Anyway, um, and then you can see some of our experimental facilities. We've got a linear accelerator. We've got gas guns. There's a radio hydrograph center for, for uh, implosion um, research and things like that. So it's 47 square miles in northern New Mexico off by itself for a reason. And uh, that's uh, where I work. Um, some history in computing. So we've been doing computing for a long time. I was telling somebody at, at uh, breakfast this morning that that uh, we actually ran the first production program on ENIAC. ENIAC was a, a system at University of Pennsylvania, and we actually ran the first production code on that for a small period of time. And when I went to work at the lab, uh, my mentor, Mars Devaney, she actually was one of the programmers that programmed that machine. And the way you program that machine is by length of wires. So you cut length of wires, and you programmed it that way. And she actually still had some wires in her office and she showed me those when I showed up at the lab, and I thought that was pretty slick. Um, so anyway, we, we actually decided to build our own machine you know, later in the 40s, and uh, uh, Nick Metropolis and John Von Neumann out uh, there in the far left um, built the machine at Los Alamos, and there's actually eight millimeter um, movies of them building this, this monstrous tube monstrosity. I was, I was fascinated by the city talk yesterday. I think I'm really glad that that talk happened. Um, he mentioned Monte Carlo. Monte Carlo was actually invented by Nick Metropolis. My son actually dated his granddaughter, I think. Um, so that's a fascinating story. So anyway, we've been involved in lots of projects and lots of machines for, for a long time, including Maniac and Stretch, which I think is an interesting story because Stretch actually is the, was the beginning of the IBM 360 architecture. Most people don't know that, but that's where it came from. It was a joint project with Los Alamos. Um, we had lots of CDCs. We had the first Cray one. You probably know that. Lots of Crays, thinking machines, other kinds of machines up until modern day era, which today is, is the Trinity machine down there in the bottom left, and Ziggy, which is our D-Wave machine. That's a quantum computer that we're playing with, quantum annealing system. Um, and we're on the pro in the process of buying another machine for 2020 called Crossroads. Um, don't ask me why these things get their names, because it's a long story. Um, <clears throat> we actually, another interesting artifact is we're doing some history at the, at the lab, history of computing. Since we've been computing for longer than pretty much any company has been computing, we decided to start uh, preserving some of our history. We've scanned over 50,000 artifacts um, and OCRing them, and we're going to try to release as much of this information as we possibly can. We're working with the University of Minnesota Babbage Institute on this. And this is a, a scan that I just pulled up. Um, it's actually a letter from our procurement department to to Seymour Cray about how we were interested in buying a computer and, you know, that he was going to build when he left CDC um, in 1975, which showed up in 1976 and, and didn't work. <laughs> we had to get it to work. Um, and I think we've had to get every computer that we've ever bought to work ever since. So, so a little bit of storage history, some I, just because I like old pictures. Um, there's an I, IBM 3850. Some of you may know what that was. That was one of the first robots for tape. The tapes were this little honeycomb things. There was about a football field in length. It was about eight feet tall. And it had a bunch of these robots that ran along. I got these tapes and put them in. That was in the, in the 70s and, and 80s. The 
I was in the photo store, there's four of those actually ever built. One went to Livermore, went to Los Alamos, one went to NSA, and one went to the Library of Congress, I think. And um, they actually burned the ones and zeros on, on um, uh, microfish. And so the ones and zeros were like coded barcode on microfish, and there was little, little uh, boxes, like razor blade boxes, full of these microfishes, and there were robots that picked them and read them. And my predecessor that had my job before me said, you could always tell when there was a really good computing day because that night, when you come in the morning, the whole place would smell like burned plastic because everybody was writing their output to this, this device, which was, I think, four megabytes, which at the time was pretty big, right, in the 60s. Um, so anyway, some, some of that background. A little bit of background, you know, more modern background about how we do things. So this is a fairly simple view of our, our, one of our computing environments. And at any one time, we'll probably have one, we'll have one premier machine, a large machine. That machine happens to be Trinity, the one up in the far left. It's got two petabytes of main memory. It's about 20,000 nodes. Um, it's got four petabytes of flash. Um, that runs at about four terabytes a second. I don't know why that says two. Um, it has its own local scratch file system, 100 terabytes, uh, 100 petabytes, and runs at about a terabyte a second. And um, and uh, and then there's a site, and then there's a whole bunch of other machines. So the whole bunch of other machines are smaller machines, <clears throat> say 100 100,000 cores and down. And big machines are sort of 100,000 cores and up to multi-million. Um, and we have lots of those machines, and they're, they actually share some site-wide scratch file systems that are pretty modest. They're in the tens of gigabytes a second to hundreds of gigabytes a second. There's a parallel archive that writes to tape in parallel, the HPSS system, and, um, and then a bunch of file transfer nodes and other kinds of things. Um, and so anyway, that's where our environment looks. The, the, the network in the middle there is a storage area network that we designed. It's, it used to be built out of Ethernet a long time ago, um, metropolitan area network switches that were glued together to get the kind of bandwidth we needed. Now um, it's all at Finiband. It's roughly, say, four terabytes a second of storage area network bandwidth, so we can move data pretty quickly uh, through it. Um, so it's highly parallel, as you can imagine. <clears throat> and, um, and a typical job for us will run about six months on about half a million cores. So we'll run a job on half a million cores to, to a million cores on the big machine for about six months to maybe a year. Um, so the jobs run for a very, very long time. They eat up lots and lots of memory for a very, very long time. Um, because they run for so long, the, the, um, something will die. Something will die within hours. So you have to basically save your work. So you checkpoint your, your memory out to, to some solid state storage or some disk or something like that to be able to restart from it because something is going to die within hours. Um, so the, the applications essentially, you know, compute, checkpoint, compute, checkpoint. And some of those checkpoints are written to this flash tier, some of them are written to this parallel file system, and, and further down in the stack. Uh, this is, again, our current largest machine. Again, it's a Haswell Knight's Landing combo machine. It's 20,000 nodes, a few million cores that have gone through this already. Um, and um, it's basically, that, those are the tiers of storage. The 30 petabytes a year of site-wide SMR, um, I'll be talking about in a minute. That's the MarFS project that I was talking about. And then this tape system. So what, is a, what does it take to get a, a machine like this to work? Well, first you start some number of years in advance and you buy $27 million worth of 36-inch water pipes and you put them in your floor to get water to it to cool the 12 megawatts that the machine, or 18 megawatts that the machine costs you. And so that's what 20, uh, that's what 36 inch water pipes look like. Um, and and uh, yes, I did buy $27 million of them to connect the thing to the, the towers that cool it. Um, and um, we actually, that would crush your floor. It would crush anybody's floor. And so we actually had to cut holes in our floor, put pylons in the ground, build a, a bridge out of you know, constructional steel to, to suspend this thing so that it wouldn't crush the building. Um, and this goes in for every one of the big machines we have. So you know, I have a machine coming in in 2020 that's supposed to be you know, 20 megawatts or so, 25 megawatts. And it'll take another one of these you know, huge endeavors to get it to work. Um, the copper required to hook up that many megawatts is really quite a bit too. Copper is very expensive. And these huge bus bars that each carry like four megawatts each, and there's running through the building, and 
And so anyway, um, it, I, the reason I take you through that is because infrastructure has become a very, very large part of what we do. It used to be a very trivial amount of what we do. All the storage and networking and pipes and, and pumps and all that stuff used to be 5%. And now it's close to 30% of our budget. And a lot of that is storage. And so um, that's an important fact, I think. And I think the city guy mentioned that that was the case for them, too. Our storage area network, uh, we started this a long time ago back in the we are like 2002 or something. I think we're on our third variant of it today. It's all InfiniBand. This is what it looked like back in 2011. There were 12 um, metropolitan area network uh, Ethernet switches that were glued into machines together with the storage, but now it's all InfiniBand, and it's, I think it's four terabytes a second or something like that. Let me talk you through a little bit about how storage works in, in this HPC world. We sort of live on the edge, two different edges. One edge is a million cores, and each core, all at the same time, decide they want to drop a file in the same directory at exactly the same time. So within, you know, way less than a millisecond, they all say, gosh, make me a file in this directory. And of course, the file server falls over and dies and comes back and so forth. Eventually, you get your files created, and so highly, highly scalable metadata systems are very important to us because of this high insert rate all of a sudden of metadata entries into directories. Or the other extreme, everybody decides they want to create one file. So there's one file, and they all decide they want to sprinkle data into that file all at the same time. And so they're sprinkling data in here and there in different offsets of the file, and so it's a locking nightmare, and that is really hard to do too. And so those are the two dominant patterns of I.O. for us, is all million cores decide to make a file all at the same time, or all of them decide to drop a little, sprinkle little data all over a single file all at the same time. And so those are the two extremes, but we don't have that much you know, in the middle. It's always either one or the other. Um, so the, the files end up being various sizes all the way from, you know, from zero bytes to, to, to tens of petabytes. So you know, imagine a multi-petabyte size file, we have those. Um, our workflows, again, are, you know, last for years, as many as a couple of years, and yes, it does use a million cores for and petabytes of DRAM for, for that long. And so because of the fact that the, uh, the costs of, of doing business at our site isn't mostly machine anymore, it's machine plus all this infrastructure, including storage and networking and pumps and pipes and copper and things like that, we decided that we needed to specify how we buy our machines differently. And in the past, we bought them based on flops or based on how fast an application would run. But that's just not true anymore because data movement and all these other costs have become quite large. And so we've actually invented this thing called a workflow specification. And the way we buy machines now isn't I want to buy in amounts of petaflops or anything like that. It's I want to run this problem. And I want to run this problem six times more with more fidelity than it was run in the past. And I still want to get an answer every day because I'm a human and I want to come in and look at the result every day and talk to my neighbors about how, how the calculation's going. Um, I'd like for the machine to go forward 90% of the time. So 10% of the time it can be all messed up. It can be doing checkpoints and restarts and other useless work just to keep the calculation going. But I want it to be calculating 90% of the time. and. Um, and I need to specify how much data movement I'm going to be doing because that may, may factor in to the efficiency of using this machine. And so we went through all of our applications, all four or five of them. We don't have many applications. The ones we do are huge, tens of millions of lines of Fortran and other kinds of things like that. So they're very complicated. Um, we created these workflows of the, the applications of how big is your input, how big is your output, how hot does that data need to be mapped it into our tiers of storage and so forth. Um, and, we've, and we wrote that all out, and we basically provided that in a big table of here's our applications, here's, our, here's how much input, here's how much output, all those sorts of things. Here's how often this workflow runs versus that workflow. Basically, we were trying to describe to the vendors that we're going to bid on one of these quarter of a billion dollar machine purchases, here's what we're going to do with this machine for the next four years. You build a machine that will run the most number of these through in its lifetime. And so our, our, our RFPs have moved from very tight, specified, I want this amount of flops and I want this amount of megabytes per second to we just want to run this application and it needs to run six times bigger. And oh, by the way, here's the workflow we're going to run it in. 
please build me a machine that optimizes that. So enough background, let's get on to this MarFS thing. Why did we call it MarFS? Mar is Spanish for C, um, so it's the C file system, I guess, sort of a play on Data Lake. Um, although there was a revolt against uh, uh, jargon, so I'll try to stay away from that. Um, so uh, how, how do we get here? So economics really shape what we do, um, and we have these huge machines with multi-petabytes of memory, and what, you know, and we have to checkpoint them. And, and so forth, and there's an efficiency mechanism that we have to deal with. And so how do we, how do we um, deal with this kind of a world in storage? Um, so I, I basically what happened is back in 2008, 2009, I did this model. And the model was essentially how much storage are we going to need on the floor and of what types? And I took the, the, the input to this was I'm going to buy machines. I'm going to buy a machine in 2020, and I'm going to buy a machine back in 2015, and one back in 20. 10, and they're going to be of this size, you know, a petabyte in 2010, and three or four petabytes in 2020, and 2015, and eight or 10 petabytes in 2020. And so I knew kind of how big the machines were going to be, and, and roughly how much memory was going to be on the floor. And, and basically, you take that and you take the input of how, how frequently do you think these machines are going to fail. And they fail based on how big they are. And so if it's a really big machine, it's going to fail more often. We have, we have statistics that tell us that. So we take all that information, we feed it in, and we say, how much is it going to cost me to buy a storage system to do this? And there's two factors, bandwidth and capacity. You've got to have X amount of capacity because the machines are of a certain size and you need to keep a certain number of copies of them. And the bandwidth is related to how often the machine will die. And so the model basically spit out this, this uh, you know, possibilities of how you would go about doing this. And Essentially, the, the upper left graph says, you know, all disk was, is the red line, and all flash is the green line, and a mix of flash and disk is the blue line. And, um, and for me, the most important thing about this graph was that it was the first time that I ever got to put millions of dollars on a log scale. So as a manager, that's a big thing for me, right? So if I, I knew I hit the big time, because I was putting millions of dollars on log scales. Um, and so you can see that there was a crossover point back in 2012 or 13 for us where buying disk and, get, and getting enough capacity and getting the bandwidth for free ended. And buying, um, and so if you ended up buying enough bandwidth, you ended up having to buy far more capacity than you really needed you, buying disk. And so, and the same thing is true for, for buying like flash, if you bought enough flash for capacity, you would have way too much bandwidth for what you're trying to do. And so a, a crossover essentially was economically feasible that you, you build a tiered system where you have some flash for, for bandwidth, then you have some from disk for capacity, which may sound obvious, but uh, you know, we basically wanted to figure out what the numbers really look like, and so we modeled it, um, and that's, this is the output of that model. And from that model came this thing called burst buffers, which uh, you can blame that word up for, on me because I invented it. And, um, and so uh, essentially it's this flash tier that supercomputers put in to checkpoint to. And so now there are vendors that sell those, and I'll tell you about those in a minute. The other thing that I did was I said, okay, what happens below the machine? What happens to the storage below the machine, below, you know, further down in the tier? How much is that going to cost me? And so I had this model that I've been using for almost 30 years on how much archives cost. And archives in our world were this parallel tape systems and robots and tapes and tape drives and servers and all that kind of stuff. And always that model was based on how many cartridges you buy. That dominated the cost of everything else. You could just basically say, how, much, how many pallets of cartridges do I, am I going to eat per month? And that's how much the thing is going to cost me. Everything else, all the other costs were dwarfed. Um, however, for the first time, this model spit out these little red lines. And the red lines are tape drives. And I said, hey, wait a minute. What am I doing buying you know, $15 million worth of tape drives that year? How, how the hell does that happen? You know, why has my model gone crazy? Well, it hasn't. It's, it's basically the same problem that we now have a bandwidth problem instead of a pure capacity problem. And tape is not exactly a bandwidth play. It's a capacity play. You know, tape, every tape drive you buy gets you some bandwidth, but not every cartridge you buy gets you some bandwidth. And so 
we ended up saying, well, gosh, maybe we need to mix disk in with the tape, just like we said we needed to mix flash in with the disk to make this all happen. And of course, being you know a 50-year you know, worker kind of storage guy, the way you solve all problems in storage is, is you know, tiers. <laughs> and so I threw tiers at it, and tiers, one tier of flash and another tier of disk, and presto, the problem goes away um, if you mix in a bunch of software. And so that's basically what we did. So before Trinity, Trinity is our 2015 machine that has this multi petabytes of memory. We were essentially using memory, parallel file system, and then archive. That was our tiers of storage. Um, Luster parallel file system for the parallel file system and this HPSS parallel tape system. After Trinity, because the machine's memory is so enormous, um, we actually went to this, you know, add some tiers. We added the burst buffer tier. The burst buffer tier uh, is this flash that lives inside the machine. And a campaign tier, which is a tier of, of cheaper disk that lives between the fast disk and the tape. And you can see that the rates, you know, memory runs at multi petabytes a second if you have 20,000 nodes. Um, burst buffers are more like four to six terabytes a second. Parallel file system is a fourth of that, or actually the target going forward is a tenth of that. Um, the campaign storage is, is about a tenth of that, and the archive is about a tenth of that. So each step of the, down the tree you, you go, you, you lose about a, t uh, you know, a factor of 10 in, in bandwidth. Um, so what, what happened back in, you know, from the 2009 aha moment, oh, we need to throw a flash tier in, is these products were built, right? And so DDN invented this thing called the Inf Infinite Memory Engine, um, and it came basically right from this work. Um, and essentially, it's a burst buffer tier. It's a tier that you write to before you write to your parallel file system. Um, EMC um, entered, entered the fray with this, uh, this product called ABBA, uh, Advanced Burst Buffer Appliance, which uh, there's a picture of the ABBA you know, singing group there. And, um, and Craig entered, the, the foray, you know, entered, entered this foray with a, um, a product called Data Warp, and Data Warp is, uh, of course, powered by dilithium crystals. Um, but it's essentially this flash layer that you buy inside of your machine to write to. Um, and the interface is really hilarious. The interface is, is um, is a lot like JCL. Anybody that knows me knows I carry these cards around um, to, to take notes on. And uh, if you remember JCL, JCL had this stage in and stage out. So you know, at the beginning of your job, I need my stuff recalled from tape and put into somewhere. And then I want to run my job. And then when I'm done, on if I exit, you know, if I exit good, I want to write this out. And if I exit bad, I want to write that out. And so that's kind of the interface to this thing is you. Submit your job. It's going to run for a long time. It stages this stuff in in parallel, at, you know, several terabytes a second from from a lower tier into flash. You run for whatever. You write out checkpoints, and eventually you decide it's time to leave. I'm going to write my stuff out, and it stages the stuff out in parallel, and the next job uh, starts running. So anyway, that's what burst buffers are. There's products that have been developed on it, and it was quite the hoopla. Um, uh, so, so in addition to that, let me just go back to, to something I think I skipped over, which is um, this. So back with storage, not only have we caused things like burst buffers to be invented, but we've, we've actually caused a bunch of other things to happen. And, and Monte Carlo was actually one of the things that was mentioned earlier. Um, but these things that are listed over on the right, we had a whole lot to do with, not just burst buffers. Luster, I went to DOE and got the money to build Luster back in 2011. Um, Luster is here because the DOE funded it. Um, so you can like it or not, but and you can always blame it on me. That's OK. But it's, it lives because DOE started it. Panassas is, um, is very similar. We started working with them in 2010, as in 2001. Um, and they took our specs directly from, from us. They decided to go get venture capital. Um, but it was essentially the attempt before Luster. GPFS wasn't called GPFS when we started working with IBM on that product. Um, and it wouldn't be what it is today if we hadn't dumped you know, tens of millions of dollars into it. Most of is HPSS. Ceph, this is an interesting story. Ceph actually was a DOE project at University of California, Santa Cruz. We, we wanted them to do research into scalable metadata and scalable security and file systems and other sorts of things. And they came back and said, we need to write a prototype user space file system 
that's object-based to play with these concepts, would you pay us $300,000 a year to, to develop that? The answer is yes, we'll do, do that, and they hired Sage. He was a, a graduate student, and so that's how Seth came about. A data tree, you know, the, the list goes on and on. So we've had a, a, our fingers in this pie for a long time, and I thought, think that's interesting. So let's go back to there. Um, so, uh, but more recently, since, since uh, the realization that we needed to add tiers, the question that we started asking ourselves is, is that too many tiers? Should you, you know, is there some other way to slice this so that you have fewer tiers so that the software is less complex? And it looks like that that may happen. What we're seeing is that, um, you know, flash and other solid state kinds of technologies are, are finding their way up into memory. They're also finding their way down into the disk world. And so it very well could be that, that uh, the, the high end part of what parallel file systems do for us today could be covered by flash someday if the economics provide that. And basically, the, the, everybody's saying cost of flash is going to go down. And so we think this is going to happen. And then the capacity tier, um, you know, if the object storage works really, really well, maybe it can take over the capacity part of what the file system provides, and maybe the file system would go away, um, which is possible, and even the archive might go away. And so I put down at the bottom, rest in peace, parallel file system, and I think I'm one of the only few people in the world that can actually write that down with a clear conscience because I was there when we invented all of them. In fact, funded most of them. And so. Um, so anyway, that's, it's interesting. I think this is where we're headed. It's unclear, but um, it feels like that's where we're going. So, so this, this capacity tier that we need to build, um, basically it's, you know, how do, how do we do that? And I doubt that, that, you know, we're the only, we're unique. HPC is not unique in needing a capacity tier, something that's not hot or warm. It's really cool. Um, so. The question really is, you know, okay, we need this, ca this campaign store, this capacity tier. What are its requirements? Well, for us, the very, very high level requirements, so there's a lot more than this, of course, is we need billions of files in a directory. We're going to have machines that have billions of cores. They're going to want to drop a file per, per core into a directory. We need a something that manages a billion thingies in a folder-like thing. We also need trillions of files total because it won't take very long to collect that many files. And we need files that span from one byte all the way up to, say, 100 petabytes. And so this is a pretty broad span of, of requirements. Um, and we also need multiple writers into the same file. It's just an HPCism. So those things are pretty hard to do. Let's put those out as the first sets of you know, hard requirements that whatever we do has to conquer. So what do we do about that? How do we, how do we close this gap? How do we provide this, this capability? Um, First place we looked was the cloud. We said, gosh, won't the cloud solve this for us? Would it be nice if the cloud solved this for us? They have really big data. They have lots of devices. They have, uh, have you know, lots of use cases. Maybe we can use some of that technology. They have erasure, which is really, really nice. They've got objects which scale really nicely. Um, it's got this simple-minded put-get-delete interface. Maybe, maybe that will work. But no, not really so much. And the reason why is because um, it works great for newly written apps. If you're writing a brand new Dropbox or a brand new Flickr, it works really great. But if you've invested, I don't know, some number of billions of dollars into applications that expect something that looks like folders and some assemblance of POSIX, which I think lots of places do have that problem, um, it just really isn't quite the right answer. Um, it's, it's cheap storage, but it's not quite the right answer. Um, so anyway, we needed something that had a little bit of POSIX in it. And uh, so it really wasn't the whole answer. It, was, it felt like just part of the answer. So we said, gosh, why don't we just figure out how we're going to put some sort of a fairly close to POSIX interface on top of this cloud-based erasure. We get the best of both worlds. We get object scalability on the data and so forth. You know, all this economic appeal, a lot of work that we don't have to pay for. And um, we also get this you know, um, POSIX namespace ability although we'll have to figure out how to scale it. Um, and then there are some challenges. The challenges are, of course, POSIX and objects don't get along. Their security models are different. The read-write semantics is different. The efficiency in the you know, object file sizes versus object sizes is different. There's no update in place with objects. You know, how, do we, how do we do this? You know, what trade-offs do we make to get this built in a reasonable time frame to solve the problem we have? So the first uh, 
thing we always ask ourselves is, gosh, won't somebody else do it for us, please? I mean, <laughs> we don't need to do everything ourselves. And so we looked. Yeah, and we looked all over. We looked at CleverSafe and Scality and Viper and Ceph and all over the place and Lester and you know, Nirvana and iRods, all kinds of things trying to figure out if anybody would do this for us. And there's some close things. Gluster is kind of close, but not exactly it. Um, camera store looks interesting, but that, that's uh, very, very young. Um, you know, these, these, these things like a viewer are really cool. You can, you know, you can put um, NFS over objects, but there's no way you can do multiple riders into it. And, and contemplating a petabyte size file in an Avere system, even if you bought a million of them, doesn't, you know, that wouldn't work. And so the problems were just too big to, to buy a solution for this, we thought. And we still think that's probably true. And so we said, OK, fine, let's leverage everything we can out of cloud, but let's go write the parts that we can't seem to get. So what is MyFS? It's the parts we couldn't get. So it's this POSIX namespace. It stripes data, stripes POSIX metadata across multiple POSIX file systems. So it uses POSIX file systems to store metadata, and metadata only, lots and lots of them. And it stores its data in whatever the hell you want to store it in. So there's this plugin at the bottom. You can plug in an object store, like we were using Scality actually right now. We have 30 petabytes of that in test, actually in production. Um, EMC, ECS, and we even ha have written a prototype um, erasure code that sits on top of ZFSs. So you have, think, say, two or 3,000 ZFSs each at like 17 plus 3, and you put a 10 plus 2 on top of that and, um, and, stripe, and stripe and do objects across that so that you get high, high, high availability. Um, we actually use the Intel Storage Acceleration Library to do that with, which is a very cool library. You should really try it if you haven't. It uses the um, AVX instruction set for uh, getting really, really high-speed Galois functions for, for erasure. Um, so anyway, the idea is we just want to scale, you know, sew together multiple object systems and multiple POSIX file systems and make something that looked like a, sort of like a POSIX file system almost, but not quite, um, that scaled really, really widely. And so that's what um, RFS is. Um, one of the things that we wanted to make sure we did was we wanted to be friendly to the object system. So you can't hand an object system a petabyte object. It, it, they, don't, they don't like that. <laughs> um, nor can you hand it a whole bunch of one byte files because they don't like that either. And so we package small files into nice large chunks for objects. And we cut up great big files into chunks so that they don't see this icky workload that we produce. Um, and we wanted to scale the POSIX file system, uh, the, the metadata system. And so I'll show you how we did that. Uh, what is it not? So it's not a full-blown parallel file system. Um, the biggest thing that it doesn't do is it doesn't allow update in place. So um, you can't go seek to byte for and write. If you do that, you'll get EIO. Um, so you, you're required to write it serially, the file, from beginning to end except for if you use our library or our tool that you can write it in parallel and then you can actually write and you know do, the, do that sort of stuff but you can't through a normal um, POSIX interface the amount point you cannot do update in place um, and there's no protection against people doing um, multiple writers into the same file and so sort of that sort of thing you, you basically you're you know, but, but there's no protection in POSIX either you can, you can shoot yourself in the foot with POSIX too so it's not that's not a POSIXism, it's just a statement of fact. <clears throat> How do we scale the metadata? The metadata looks like this. At the top level, you can have multiple project directories, which, which um, in our world is really essentially a directory metadata server. So we separated out directory metadata from file metadata. And the reason we did that is because the relationships are different. Um, so you can have as many of these directory metadata servers as you'd like and bust your tree up any way you want. And then you can see that for each one of those projects, one of the, each one of those directory metadata servers, you can have as many file metadata servers as you want. And that's where the files live. So the files are hashed by name into these metadata servers, into these file metadata servers. You can have as many of those as you want. Um, the reason we did that is because we thought that eventually we might want to put the file metadata servers, turn those into key value stores instead of having them be full-blown POSIX file system servers. And that the, 
directory servers, we might want to be triple stores. Triple stores, that's what a directory is, is a relationship between two things. Um, and so that's why it was done that way. We haven't got done that yet, but we may. And then you can see that essentially then the files point at you know, places in the object space where you can have as many object servers as you like. And the interesting thing about this is we did a scalability study of this with a prototype just recently. Um, we actually retired an 8,000 node machine uh, a few weeks ago and we decided, gosh, before we shut it off, let's do a scalability study of this. So, so that it's kind of absurd because who would buy an 8,000 node metadata server? It's, it's, you know, it's an absurd test, but it's, it was interesting and, and the machine was sitting there and we thought, what the hell, let's beat the crap out of it before we get rid of it. Um, so we did that and we, we got up to 850 million inserts a second of files into the same directory. <clears throat> and not only that, but we, you could still stat a single file within you know, millisecond, right? And so that's pretty cool. It's pretty neat. It's a very, very scalable metadata system. That's not the production code we're running. That was just a test, but uh, we just but wanted to see how, well, how well this thing scales. It also has some pretty interesting characteristics, like you can, you can do a parallel reader. So instead of opening a directory and doing a reader, 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 and getting back in serial, you can say open a directory and fire up a whole crap load of processes and go get all the entries from the directory all at once in parallel. And so you can, you can get that stuff back in some blinding rates, millions a second. Um, so that's interesting. Um, how would you deploy this thing? Uh, the way we deploy it is we have interactive file transfer agents for moving data around, and we have batch file transfer agents for moving data around. So in our world, when you want to move a petabyte around, you don't log on and say CP, because that would take like you know seven years. And so you submit a job to a batch system, and it, it runs a nice parallel file copy utility that will copy stuff in parallel, and walk trees in parallel, and move stuff in parallel, and load balance all the work and restart if it dies and all that kind of stuff because it takes a long time to move that amount of data. Um, so you log on an interactive node and you can do simple things like LS and tar and pipe data into to, to objects and things like that. But essentially, if you want to move a great big tree, you submit a job to these batch FTAs and the batch FTAs, let's say, walk the luster tree in parallel and write the stuff out to object. And, and that's even cool, right? Because not only do you have this parallel copy utility that is completely parallel in every way, but it's all RDMA. We read from Luster using LNet. It's RDMA right into memory. We calculate the erasure in, in place, and then we write the stuff out to the object system um, all using RDMA. So we're hardly using the processor at all to do any of this work uh, other than the erasure itself. And so it's very efficient. We expect to get 10 gigabytes a second per server or something like that quite easily. Where, you know, we're using 100 gigabit um, infinity band everywhere, so. so. Um, how does it work? Well, there's, it uses extended attributes in the, in the uh, POSIX file systems to say where the object is. And so this is an example of a file and it's got in a directory and it's got some extended attributes and extended attributes point at where that, that data is in the object server and we actually write recovery information into the objects so that at, at create time, at least, we capture all the POSIX information that created that, that's in that data so that we can recreate the namespace from the objects at create time if we wanted to. This is an example of the same thing, except it's a, it's a, uh, <clears throat> it's a bigger object. It's striped across multiple systems. Um, so you could, you know, and, and if you think about it, our objects are probably going to be about a gigabyte in size. If you have a petabyte size file, that's a million objects in one file. So it's a lot of stuff to keep track of. Um, and then this is a packed file, which is packing small files into a big object. And so you can see that that's how that all works. This is a, an example of our parallel copy tool, how it works. It's got queues. It does reader operations in parallel. It does stat operations in parallel. And it does move, copy, compare operations in parallel. So one of the things you could tell it to do is compare this petabyte size file system with that petabyte size file system and throw as many nodes at it as you wanted and it would just do it in parallel. Um, so that's kind of slick. <clears throat> and it's restartable, so if it gets so far in and, you, and it dies, you need to restart it, it'll restart. So how does that, how does this MarFS thing fit into our environment? Well, remember, um, we had 
this, you know, layout of big machines and small machines and shared resources and not. Um, and it fits right into this storage area network. It plugs in just like every other big major data source that we have. It's, you know, targeted at, at like 100 gigabytes a second, which is pretty modest compared to our big, big parallel file systems. And we think it's going to grow by something like 30 to 60 petabytes a year until we buy a bigger machine in 2020. And then it'll grow by some bigger amount each year. So it's the slope changes every five years when we buy a big machine. Um, and so that's where it fits. That's what it's going to be used for. The, the duration of the data is years, not decades. If you want to keep data for decades, you need to write it on tape. That's actually the, the whole talk. Um, that's actually not me, but I was there then um, in that picture. It's all open source. It's a BSD license. No, no encumberments. Just don't blame us if it doesn't work. That's where it lives. Um, thank you for your attention. I guess I can take questions for a little bit. <clears throat> can I rename directories between projects? You can, but that is a copy of a um, of a meta of a metadata uh, pointer. So it's not a move of a pointer; it's a copy of a pointer, but it doesn't move any data. But we don't do hard links, so it, it's so it's symbolic links and or directories. So you can do that too. So have you thought about adding deduplication to your system? Adding deduplication. Um, we thought about even duplication and compression for I don't know how many decades. Um, we've tried to duplication. It turns out that that the big files in here are high entropy data sets, so they're they're plasmas running over one another, or they're shock waves going through materials, and so the entropy of the data is enormous. And so compression for us, you know, we end up in the five to thirty percent range on a really good day with wind behind our back. Um, Dedupe turns out we've tried between time steps and other sorts of things, and dedupe gives us less than that. So, if this were a bunch of v, you know VM images or operating system backups or something like that, you know, dedupe would probably buy us something. But uh, we found very little, uh, very little value in dedupe or compression on the data. The metadata, on the other hand, is very, very compressible and/or deduplicatable because. You know, when you have a million files in a directory, you don't name them all unique names. It's like you know, file dot one and file dot two. So it compresses like crazy. Um, so metadata compresses really well. Another thing that we use compression and, and we could use deduplication on in our site is the log data, the output of these machines. So maybe I have forty-five thousand nodes on the floor, and they're creating maybe a terabyte an hour of log. You know, my fans not working really well or whatever. These things just spew logs like crazy. And you want to do analytics on the in, to make your environment work well, and so compression probably would work well there. But in general, it's not a big win for us. You may have mentioned this, and I missed it. Where's MarFS deployed? Um, in our environment? Yeah, just Los Alamos. Or oh, only at Los Alamos right now, uh, and there's a reason for that. Um, every different DOE lab and big supercomputing center kind of has a different mission. Um, like Oak Ridge and, and Argonne are science centers, and so they run science codes. The science codes typically are far less uh, complex because they're written by a university professor and his five students or something like that, right? Uh, and the weapons complex, and they have hundreds of codes. We have three codes, and they're enormous, and you know, 100 times bigger. There's 30 people that have worked on it for 20 years. It has to run beside its sister because they have to get the right answer and all that kind of stuff because it's decision support and not science. Um, and so we tend to run our jobs for a really, really, really long time, and we tend to run very few of them, and they're enormous. And so our lab hit it first because we're the weapons certification lab. Other labs will get to it at some point, and they're certainly watching what we're doing. Um, including other agencies. In fact, we've had many DOD visitors come talk to us. Um, we think it'll be used other places. We're open to that. It's open source. Join if you want. But we think we just hit it first because of our mission. So what's the consistency model across the POSIX namespace? What are the kind of operations that you had to relax for autonomous and to be able to maintain consistency across these 
hundreds of metadata servers in the, this enormous file system? Um, for the most part, it's atomicity problems because you, you're, you're doing things that, that require uh, multiple operations that normally would be atomic in, an, in a file system. And because of what we're doing with these linkages between file systems, you end up having to do more than one operation. And you want it to be as atomic as you can, but there's no way to make it atomic because it's multiple systems. So largely, that's where the weakness is in the metadata system, is in things that really ought to be atomic but aren't. That's why we were thinking about going to key value stores eventually, is because we gain control of that semantic, which we don't have by having multiple, uh, multiple you know, POSIX metadata servers doing the job. So you, you shouted out one of the things that I support, something called the ISA-L, the Intelligent Storage Acceleration Libraries. It's fast. I love it. Are you aware that we've released under BSD license on GitHub everything in that library, and, and not just the erasure coding pieces, but the hashing pieces, the compression yep. pieces? Yep. You've, you've checked that out? In fact, we, uh, we actually collect, a, we do a CRC32 on every megabyte. And then we sum those, and that gets stored with the objects, and we use that really super fast CRC32. That's great. And we got Haswells up the wazoo. I probably have, I don't know how many, <laughs> 25,000 Haswells, right? And yeah. so it's awesome. I mean, on my Mac, it, it, I, can, I can do a 10 plus 4 at like 14 gigabytes a second. It's incredible. It's, yeah. an, it's an amazing piece of work. That's great. I just want to make sure you're away. Thank you. <laughs> I would use the compression, but I've given up. <laughs> High entropy data doesn't compress worth the crap. What is the criteria for you to qualify Flash before even being deployed into this system? Uh, <clears throat> that, the way we deploy large amounts of Flash is by buying a quarter of a billion dollar machine where Flash is $25 million of it. And we, um, we put stuff on the vendor like it has to last this amount of time. Um, we actually had to put throttles into the, uh, into the flash system to allow it, because a supercomputer could override it and kill it in a day. You know, I could kill $25 million worth of flash in, in, in 10 hours if I wanted to. Um, so we had to throttle it, right? So basically, you get an EIO if you do more than 10 overrides a day. Um, so we had to think about that kind of stuff, but it's mostly done through this, these huge, big contracts and sets of acceptance criteria on those contracts that those poor vendors have to work their way through for three months to get paid the quarter of a billion dollars um, to be able to do that. So it's largely tied up in contracting and acceptance and how we do all that. But we did specify durabilities, replacement part counts, and things like that that had to be done because of the durability of Flash. Go ahead. What kind of tools are used? Um, I don't know. You know. The vendors do that. Our specifications are higher level than that. You know, thou shalt not fail more than this, all that kind of stuff. Or you get a penalty and you have to pay us something, right? And so we do it through pure economic means. We don't run the tools the vendors do. So Cray, for example, does that for us when we buy a Cray machine or whoever. And they actually turn it around and put it on Intel because Intel made the <laughs> You know, make flash. One last question. So on the very large files, you talked about them having extremely large numbers of chunks in the, that are each separate objects. Can you quickly discuss uh, how you achieve uh, scalability of the tracking and management of all those chunks in those multi-petabyte files? Sure. We cheat like crazy. Um, it's, a, it's a formula. Uh, you know, and which means update in place is not really feasible. When we went into this, we said, we don't update in place a petabyte size file anyway. Nobody goes in and seeks four bytes and changes it. It's a snapshot of something that, that calculated, you know, simulation calculated. So luckily our application, our primary application, is kind of write only and never update. And because of that, we took this huge shortcut and said, let's just use a, a formula for figuring out where the parts are. and be done with it. So we cheat. <laughs>